<clears throat> so this is the part three lecture of the radial distribution function talking about what information is contained within it, how you read a plot of the radial distribution function, and how we generate atomic positions from a molecular simulation, whether it's a Monte Carlo or a molecular dynamics simulation. So we are going to now just quickly cover how do we calculate the actual radial distribution function provided we have a series of position vectors that correspond to the x, y, z coordinates for every single particle in the system, right? So this uh, r vector is, a, is an array of vectors. So it contains everything that's in our system, right? So every position of every atom at every point in time would be contained within an r of t function, right? So this is kind of a big complex, complex abstract uh, quantity. So what we are looking to accomplish here then is to calculate the g of r, it is given by this function here. And we'll talk a little bit about the mathematics and what it means. This is the radial distribution function function, I guess. These brackets, when you see them, this means average over all particles. Sometimes you'll hear this referred to as an ensemble average. <coughs> right? So you're averaging over all of the different possible configurations over time and different individual atoms. So R, this is our position vector. This formula that we have written above, this is for a 3D radial distribution function, right? So if I had a planar molecule, the radial distribution in the plane is going to be different than out of the plane. So this function here would calculate it for all possible angular orientations. The R prime vector is a displacement vector displacement that we are going to integrate out. In a real scenario, our uh, this, this function <coughs> rho of R, this is our atomic, uh, this is this is our sort of atomic positions. So it's written as a summation of Dirac delta functions. Where if we look at this, the R of I, that corresponds to the individual atomic positions that we have in our big table. Right, we have a big table with all the atomic positions for all the time snapshots of our simulation. So the Dirac delta function is equal to infinity if x is equal to 0, and it's 0 if x is not equal to 0. Right, so it's just a sharp delta function at whatever position x is. So this, this, this quantity rho is basically a series of delta functions where there is a peak, but only at where there is an atomic position. The other property of the Dirac delta function is that when you integrate it, it equals 1. So. What this big function up top says, this first term right here is basically an array of all of the different possible, all of the atomic positions. And you're multiplying it by a displacement. 
So the only way that this function will give us anything that's not zero, right? So everything in this function is either a zero or a one. So the math looks really complex, but it's really just adding up a bunch of zeros and ones. The only way that this function here will register one, right? Because we're integrating the Dirac delta function, which gives us one. The only way that this is possible is if there are two atoms that are separated by a distance r prime. Does that make sense? Then these front terms right here are normalizing it based on the bulk density. Yes? So seven, two atoms because of the, because of the distance r prime or the same atoms that display? Two different atoms displaced by r prime. So uh, let me draw out a, an example for just two particles. So if we have our 3D space, well, actually, let's do this in two dimensions here. So we have, let's say, an X and a Y coordinate. We can have uh, some position here where there is a particle, and we'll call this vector R prime. We have a second vector, which corresponds to R prime plus R. There's another particle, so which means our vector r under this scenario here, we have two particles separated by vector r. But if we were to, let's call this, you know, r of 1, if we were to have another vector r2, there would be no particle there. So what the radial distribution function math basically works out is saying that if there are two particles separated by a set distance, we add one to our summation. And we do that for every particle, for every possible displacement. So another way to think about it is if we have a collection of particles in a box, the only time that you will add something to the radial distribution function is if you look at the separation distance between every possible pair of particles, more or less. So everything is zero, except when they are separated by a particular distance r apart. And then we tally it up and add it all together. Now this is, this is the abstract sort of derivation approach of how you would calculate the radial distribution function. In reality, this would lead, for, lead to extremely noisy data. So in practice, we employ a slightly different form of the equation. Again, it looks like a big, nasty equation, but it actually communicates a very simple concept. This is the uh, step function, this sigma. It's 1 if x is greater than 0, and it's 0 if x is less than 0. So it's just a fancy mathematical way to uh, introduce sort of a if statement into your math.
So all that this big fancy equation is trying to say is that what we're doing is we're adding up for every one particle, right, this could be particle i, we're going to look at how it interacts with every other particle in the system. We're going to sweep from r equals 0 to r equals infinity. And every time that there's a particle in the shell between r and r plus delta r, we add 1. So this big complex function, I just called it f, if it's outside of the shell, it's 0. If it's in the shell, it equals 1. We do this procedure for every single particle, and we get a radial distribution function. Now this function here, you'll notice there's no vectors anymore drawn on top. Right? That's because we have done a, a radial averaging. We're saying this is a spherically symmetric system, or we're treating it as spherically symmetric. Yes? So when you are doing it like this, each one of those like r plus delta r, where you get like some finite number of them, mm -hmm. would be where you have those like really sharp peaks at the beginning, but then once you have like a million of them in the shell, that's where it like levels up to like one? Yeah, so when you, when you calculate these radial distribution functions, uh, you need to do it for a large system or for a very long time. So these brackets for averaging, so if you just did it for one time snapshot, it would look really, really noisy. Like there would be peaks and nothing, and peaks and nothing, and peaks and nothing. But if you do it again and again and again and again and again, eventually you get that nice, smooth, continuous function. And then over time, this function here will normalize out with the, the, uh, the, the scaling factors there to the normal density. So everything should normalize out at long separation distances. Because as soon as this R gets really, really big, then the volume inside of that r plus delta r shell actually gets to be quite substantial. So you'll almost always have particles in the system. And eventually that shell will get so large that the number of particles in that volume shell is the same as you would expect based on the average bulk density of the system. And that's how you asymptotically approach one in the radial distribution function. OK, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, that's a good question. It looks like one, and I was wondering if there's like a physical intuition for why you use convolution there in the same way that you're talking about how like with diffraction you get like four units or something. I think it is a convolution integral. <clears throat> like a function convolves with itself. Yes, you are exactly correct. Yes, That's yes. What it looks like. Yes. So because the uh, and your, your background is your background physics? Yeah. Okay, that's a. Uh, yes, so the radial distribution function is often called the pair correlation function, which in, in that sense it is a self autocorrelation function. But you are correct, yes. So you are correlating the position of the particles with itself. Okay. Now, on those same lines, the last thing that I want to talk about before we switch into sort of a demo mode is that the radial distribution function is related to. The structure factor, which is what we're going to actually hopefully show uh, a couple of examples of, uh, the S of Q is often called the structure factor. And this is basically equal to its uh, scattering pattern or diffraction pattern. And this is related directly to the radial distribution function through a Fourier transform. In this case here, this is just a one-dimensional Fourier transform. So the S of Q is from experiments. And this is how we can use real experiments to validate simulations and actually measure what atomic structures are. So when we look at a diffraction pattern, what we are really seeing is effectively just the real positions of atoms transformed into Fourier space, which I'm sure means a lot to everyone.
Okay. Any questions? This is going to transition us, and I'm going to end the lecture here, and we're going to switch to old chalkboard style so I can go through any demos. Uh, but are, any, are there any questions? Yes? R is the radial distribution function. G of R is the radial distribution function, and then R is your real space position vector. And Q is what they call the scattering vector. So that's basically the, the position in reciprocal space. Right? So what you're looking at in reciprocal space is how frequently do things repeat. Right? So if two particles, well, I don't want to go too much, but um, so it's, it's best described in a crystal, more or less. So instead of assigning a crystal as saying, oh, there's a particle here and a particle here and a particle here and a particle here, and you can do that for infinity, you can just say, oh, there's a particle every this far apart. So that's what Q classifies, whereas R classifies the actual real positions of the system. But unfortunately, I have to be a little bit hand wavy on the scattering part because the math can be a bit tedious, but I'd much rather just kind of show everyone the generalized uh, sort of behavior of scattering theory. And then note that the math exists and crystallographers and scattering individuals rely on it a lot. Okay, so I'll end this up and try my hand at the demonstration.